So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I, I've had a tremendous time uh, talking with folks that are doing very different types of uh, research from my own and, uh, and some very similar. So um, over the years, um, I have been studying blood development and, and stem cells. And I'll just, I'll just kind of leap in um, to the area that I'm most interested in, and, and that is, to a certain extent, translational biology. How can we use our knowledge um, to improve the types of re regenerative medicine we have access to for patients these days? And this is, this is simply a figure that I uh, found online, and um, it's a little bit outrageous because <laughs> there are a lot of conditions that I think the general public and you know my family members, we, we all would really like to see treatable by uh, stem cells. And I think we all agree we'd like to see conditions like these uh, um, uh, curable or at least treatable with, with regenerative medicine. Um, and I, I grabbed this figure actually before I even realized um, that that bone marrow transplantation here is really the only one that's been currently established. So I had this in my presentation way before I even noticed this. And it's an important point because um, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation has really been at the vanguard of all cellular therapies. Um, but it, in many ways, is still in its infancy. Because as you can see, um, it was just 1956 that E. Donald Thomas performed the first bone marrow transplantation. Now that's just a little over 50 years ago and well within the lifetime of many of the people in the room. Um, so originally, the uh, source of the stem cells was collected from the bone marrow, um, uh, from the pelvis. And today, many patients uh, still require the use of bone marrow-derived stem cells for treatment. Uh, but stem cells are also available via mobilized peripheral blood and more recently, umbilical cord blood. And, and uh, you know, protocols are still being optimized uh, for, the, for their use. Um, in fact, children, um, because of their small body size, uh, adapt very well to the use of umbilical cord blood because volumes are small, uh, but adults oftentimes require multiple units uh, for su successful engraftment and reconstitution of their blood system. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the hematopoietic stem cell. Um, it's remarkable in its regenerative capacity. And as testament to this, uh, it just requires one blood stem cell to reconstitute the entire hematopoietic system. Now in the clinic, obviously we don't do that. There are certain components of the blood that um, are depleted rap rapidly after chemotherapy or radiation treatment, and, and so progenitor is essential. Uh, we do require more stem cells. And, and I think um, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll be convinced that uh, we do need to find ways of generating higher quality uh, stem cells uh, and also more abundant source of stem cells. And stem cells are, are actually quite extraordinary in, um, in their capacity for Hematopoietic stem cells, specifically, are, are extraordinary in the capacity for um, plasticity. Uh, so as you all know, embryonic stem cells can form just about any lineage in the body, uh, with the exception of, of um, extra embryonic or placental cells. Uh, but hematopoietic stem cells, too, can actually contribute to non-blood lineages. Um, and, and so their potential use, you can imagine, is, is kind of far and wide. Um, and yet hasn't really been fully uh, appreciated, I think. So th this is just a, a list of uh, diseases and disorders that are currently treated with hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Some of them, uh, and most commonly, uh, include leukemias uh, and lymphomas. But then there are other diseases on this list that are treated uh, with this type of therapy because their, their uh, blood system is damaged. Uh, for example, uh, brain tumors, testicular cancer. These are these are tumors that are treated by uh, you know a radiation or chemotherapy approach that then damages their hematopoietic system. So it needs to be renewed with donor cells. And uh, I would I would just point out that the current state of hematopoietic transplantation 
um, is suboptimal. It's, it's, it's very good, um, but as you'll notice, up at the very top here, um, treatment-related death associated with hematopoietic stem cell transplantation can range from 1 to 40 percent, and it's due to complications such as uh, graft versus host disease, which is essentially where the donor uh, stem cells will attack the host. Um, you can have long-term and short-term cytopenias where there's simply an insufficiency of blood cells, uh, infection, anemia that causes bleeding. So a, ho a host of problems. And, and I'll just kind of give you uh, kind of a, a quick synopsis of what all these numbers mean down here to me. You really don't need to understand them, but to, to know that when hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is used for uh, treatment of malignancies, uh, many times we rely on their ability, the donor cells, to actually attack uh, malignant cell types that are in the host's body. And, and there's a graft versus tumor effect, which is uh, especially efficient at clearing out malignancies, uh, and yet associated with that, in fact, tightly associated, is graft versus host disease, uh, which, as I said, um, involves attack uh, of the donor cells on the, on the host's uh, cells, which is, is certainly um, a long-term uh, complication and that requires, um, in many cases, lifelong uh, immunosuppression. So just to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of set a backdrop of how cells, and, and perhaps specifically of interest to me, stem cells sense their environment. and uh, and how I've been trying to utilize some information that we have about uh, stimulation of cells and external stimuli and how that might help us to promote blood development. Uh, and finally, what cellular signaling may be present in the hematopoietic precursor uh, to direct the hematopoietic program. And finally, how I envision this work moving forward uh, in a translational direction. Uh, and so first, um, I'll just give you a little bit of background about um, what, the cell, uh, what the cell properties are that allow it to sense the environment. And I'm sure that all of you are, are already very familiar with the cytoskeleton. Um, and so this is simply a depiction of cytoskeletal structure within a cell. Um, I have this, this figure here to simply uh, make the point that we can learn a whole lot from architecture and art. And in fact, uh, one of my collaborators, Dr. Donald Ingber, um, became fascinated with these structures, which uh, are all over the world, built by Kenneth Snelson, and rely on uh, tension and opposing forces uh, with these structures that consist of you know, tubular cylinders and, uh, and tension wire uh, that are suspended in the sky and are very durable yet elastic, and they respond to um, external pressure and push here and there. Um, so Dr. Ingber um, was watching cells and culture, and, and, and it occurred to him that the same principles may truly exist in the cell as well, that they respond to pressures and, uh, and, and stimulus from the outside and respond in their uh, ability to move, and, uh, and it may actually, in, in fact, impact cellular signaling within the cell. And we now know, really, that, that the cytoskeleton imposes exquisite uh, organization on protein trafficking, uh, proximity of organelles, and, of course, cellular signaling. And there are a lot of mechanisms that interface with the cytoskeleton, um, including stress-activated ion channels, um, protein receptors such as integrins and, and cadherins. Um, and so it, on, the, on the outer membrane, then, uh, there, are, there are mechanisms to translate signals interior into the cell. And a fantastic example of this exists in the vascular system. Uh, vascular biologists for over three decades have known that mechanical stress impacts both the morphology and the behavior of endothelial cells that line the vessels. Uh, and, and this is simply a depiction of a vessel uh, with laminar flow. There's a disturbance at one foci at the wall of the, uh, the lumen, and the cells at that site of disturbed flow will actually respond and produce an atherosclerotic plaque, 
um, cellular signaling changes, as you can see, some, some signals go up, some signals go down, and, uh, and this propagates vascular disease. And so there are many forces, in fact, three that I'm going to tell you about, at play within the vessel uh, and that cells can sense that line the vessel wall. Uh, the first is circum circumferential stress or cyclic strain. Um, that's essentially stretching of the cells. Um, you can imagine that cells are bound to one another by cell adhesion molecules, and any tension on that cell will, uh, will signal interior to the cell that there has been a change. Um, hydro hydrodynamic pressure is essentially compression pushing on the cell, uh, and shear stress, which is friction. So uh, the, f the, f the frictional force will be laminar flow across the cell, um, and you'll see that most of my talk focuses on that. I'll also, I'll also talk a little bit about circumferential stress. And I'm particularly interested in blood flow in particular because uh, in the embryo, Hematopoietic ontogeny is, uh, is a complex process in which primitive blood is specified in the yolk sac. Uh, red blood cells and megakaryocytes are, pr are predominant cell types. Um, and it's within this region called the AGM, or the aorta gonad uh, mesonephros, that we see the first hematopoietic stem cells arise that can actually contribute to adult-type hematopoietic stem cells. And this occurs around uh, e10.5, and if if you look here, you can uh, you can see a three-dimensional rendering of an aorta, and it's within this aorta that we find these clusters of hematopoietic cells that that bud off into the lumen of the aorta, and with blood flow, they are kind of pulled away, and they later seed the fetal liver, which then moves on to the bone marrow as uh, uh, just just preceding birth. Uh, in the mouse. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that if you, if you monitor the embryo a few days prior to this time that you see emergence of blood cells, uh, the heartbeat begins. And it's erratic at early time, uh, but by the time you see the emergence of these stem cells, the, uh, the heartbeat is rather consistent and predictable, and you can actually measure the forces present in this aortic region just along the back side of the, the embryo. And in fact, um, what was done uh, in, in, in 08 was the, um, there's a, a mouse that doesn't have a heartbeat. And as you can imagine, it, it dies during embryogenesis. But a few days um, prior to death, you can analyze the hematopoietic activity in this region that I've talked about, the AGM, uh, the, the the para-aortic expansion of pleura, or the PSP, which you're, you'll hear me talk about, um, is destined to become the AGM. So we're talking about the same region, just a little bit earlier embryo. And at this time point, this is E9.5. When, um, when you look at the embryos and, and simply stain them with uh, benzidine, that will pick up on the, um, essentially, detecting red blood cells, you see that hematopoiesis in the yolk sac is, is just fine. So this is our mutant embryo, uh, the yolk sac and embryo here in the wild type. Um, so primitive hematopoiesis seems fine, um, and yet the embryo is deficient for uh, a lot of, uh, of red blood cells. And if you analyze the capacity of the uh, PSP for blood production just by a hematopoietic progenitor assay in, in methylcellulose, you see that there's this serious drop off in uh, hematopoietic activity. And you know, at the time, it was interpreted that blood flow was essential for seeding of this site, this AGM region, from uh, hematopoietic cells that might be present in the yolk sac. So in order to uh, address some of this a little bit better and, and, and evaluate whether, whether blood flow or biomechanical force might be playing some role, we uh, established a collaboration with some vascular biologists um, this is uh, Guillermo Garcia Cardena and Luigi Adamo. Uh, they have an instrument uh, that is, is the photograph. You're looking down into the barrel of the culture surface here, this kind of pink region. Um, and this, this schematic shows you that uh, cells can be cultured on a, uh, on a plate, just a regular tissue culture plate. A cone is overlaid on top. And as this cone spins, uh, it moves the fluid. And you can 
control the waveform, essentially whether it's a constant laminar flow or whether it's a pulsatile kind of flow that would mimic the heart. And uh, meanwhile, you know, you have fresh media flowing in, you're collecting the outflow, and, um, and you're controlling the intensity of the shear stress that these cells receive. And so what we found when we collected this PSP region of the embryo, which I have depicted here and um, cultured on, on that surface, uh, was that there was large-scale upregulation of a bunch of hematopoietic genes that are essential for definitive hematopoiesis and for lympho, lymphopoiesis. Um, and some of these are master regulators of hematopoiesis, such as RUNX1, um, MIB, GATA3, um, and a host of others. And when we actually look at the cells that are formed, we see an enrichment in hematopoietic precursors. So some of you are very familiar with facts analysis and, and others aren't. Um, I'll just say that uh, FLIC1 is a mesodermal marker thought to be perhaps even the first marker that's turned on in the hematopoietic lineage. Uh, CD31 is uh, it's PCAM, it's an endothelial marker. And the boxed in region that I show here um, should give rise to hematopoietic cells. Um, and, and predominantly in this region, the, if, a, if a blood cell will form, it will go through this, uh, this phenotype right here. Um, so the static cultures produce about 0.6% of the entire culture. Uh, and, uh, and if you expose those cells to wall shear stress, which is WSS, um, you see uh, about a five-fold upregulation in that population. So you're enriching for the number of, of cells that have hematopoietic potential. And when you analyze progenitor activity with a, with a CFU assay, you see uh, you, that you have uh, an, an increase. And in fact, if you go back to those beatless embryos that don't have a heartbeat, that also did not have any hematopoietic activity in the AGM region, you can rescue that defect just by exposing them to shear stress. So uh, this is essentially you know, wild type culture, just regular static culture that you might have in an incubator without fancy instrumentation. And if you look at the beatless embryo uh, in a static condition, I'm sorry, um, static versus wall shear stress, you, you uh, bump that up at least uh, about twofold uh, in terms of hematopoietic activity. So that is rescued in large part. I'm sorry, I'm pointing at RUNX1. So gene expression is doubled. So this master regulator of hematopoiesis is doubled. And uh, in fact, you have an even more profound upregulation in, in uh, progenitor activity. So, you know, we asked another question, and that is, um, does this translate to anything meaningful in terms of transplantation? And so we designed an experiment in which we would collect that same region of the embryo, either culture under static conditions or shear conditions, uh, and then transplant into a recipient mouse. And uh, we, we utilize the CD45 system. Um, it's just like uh, many other genes in which you have two alleles, so there are two, two isoforms that we take advantage of very frequently, uh, and that is CD45.1 and CD45.2. So you can imagine uh, this embryo that I'm collecting has two alleles of CD45.2. It should only express that isoform. This uh, helper marrow down below has both alleles, so it's expressing both those uh, distinguishable antigens on the cell surface. And I can use the antibodies to detect them differently. And so um, we set up the experiment in a recipient. We can't necessarily uh, distinguish the helper from the recipient, but that's OK, because what we're looking for, essentially, is engraftment in a donor gate that's derived from our recipient. I'm sorry, that's derived from our donor. <laughs> and so what we find is that under static conditions, there are very, level, uh, very low levels of engraftment, uh, about 0.1%, uh, uh, 1.6%, which is very, uh, very insignificant. Um, in contrast, with our shear exposed samples, um, they tended to contribute at a much higher level, about 5.6%. And I'll show you um, just a, a summary of the data. We set up three, uh, I'm sorry, 13 shear exposed recipients and 13 static. So we had a total of 26. Um, and, you know, historically, um, hematopoietic precursors collected from this site 
uh, have failed to engraft recipient mice. And that's actually part of the reason we selected this age, uh, because we knew that the heartbeat was well established at that point, and that this represented a switch between this primitive or primitive to definitive hematopoiesis that I kind of described to you, where uh, the definitive should give us a lot of different types of lineages. And, and so this, this level of engraftment, uh, the, the wall shear stress exposed PSP at six weeks, five out of 13 gave us engrafted animals, uh, which, which does not sound significant, but in contrast, um, we see that the static exposed PSP, um, there were only two, and, and that by 10 weeks, that engraftment was lost. So we had engraftment persist with the, the, the stimulated cells, uh, whereas the unstimulated just kind of uh, drifted away. And this is simply a summary of that, of that data. And if we look at the lineages that these cells contribute to, we actually see that when the cells are stimulated by shear stress, uh, we have a better representation of the cells that are present. Um, the static, which are in gray, uh, don't form B cells very well. Um, they, they form T cells and, and some of the myeloid lineages, um, but the shear exposed um, produce uh, all of them rather well. And in fact, um, those same cells, if recovered from the primary recipient and transplanted into a secondary recipient, um, can in fact um, propagate that hematopoietic potential in, into the secondary recipient. So it's it's transferable, um, it's, and I guess just to summarize, um, it's transferable, um, the cells are self-renewing a bit better, and they form um, more lineages to a um, better potential. Um, and, and so I just want to make three points that, you know, shear stress is promoting the production of precursors, um, and in, the, in that precursor pool we have a better activity for hematopoietic progenitors, um, and it promotes engraftment. And I wanted to say one more thing. Um, I currently have some neonatal transfers going on to just manipulate the, um, the, the recipient niche a, a bit more, because as I said, that the engraftment levels are low. I'd really like to see uh, a little bit better resolution using some neonatal transfers. They may be um, a, a more um, a more amenable sort of uh, environment for these cells to engraft into. And so I'll just uh, touch on the cellular signaling that, uh, that we've identified exists in this hematopoietic precursor cell in this population of the embryo. We've, uh, we've looked both at biochemical and genetic signaling. And this is one of the biochemical pathways that are activated. Um, and vascular biologists have known for years that nitric oxide, which is a gas, uh, is stimulated by fluid flow, and it's very important for endothelial cells in the vasculature. And sure enough, when, when we set up uh, experiments both with uh, embryoid bodies, which are cells that are differentiated from embryonic stem cells, and with the embryos that I've already told you about, um, we, we can actually inhibit nitric oxide signaling and abrogate the response to shear stress. And, and I depict that here. Um, this is a compound that blocks uh, conversion of, of, or the processing of uh, cyclic GMP by nitric oxide synthase. And, um, and so when we treat embryoid bodies that are cultured under shear stress with L-name, which is this, um, this compound, we can suppress uh, the control compound, which is a stereoisomer that's inactive, doesn't have the same function. Um, so we're suppressing activity in embryoid bodies, and we're suppressing um, that same hematopoietic activity from embryo-derived precursors. And, and so we're also looking at the genetic signaling, and, um, and I've identified three, three pathways that we already know are important for hematopoiesis, uh, namely notch, wnt, and prostaglandin synthesis. So, um, you know, these pathways act independently and are independently important for hematopoiesis. But what we also know is that they interact. Um, for example, prostaglandins um, are known to promote Wnt signaling at low levels in the bone and the blood. Um, and in fact, Wnt is known to activate transcription of notch ligands and so therefore promote um, 
activation of the notch pathway. So I really chose to focus a little bit on the notch pathway because um, it, already, uh, it already is very well uh, acknowledged for having some role in this primitive to definitive hematopoietic switch and endowing cells with um, uh, this definitive potential. And, and it's uh, important for proliferation, differentiation, and uh, cell survival, among other, other functions. Um, and it's also associated with uh, self-renewal of HSCs um, and is downregulated in differentiated lineages. So I'm looking essentially for a signaling pathway that promotes uh, plur well, not pluripotency, multipotency and stemness type qualities. And this, this seemed to be a good candidate. So in collaboration with a graduate student in the lab, um, who looks uh, very, <laughs> very excited. Um, <laughs> he's, a, he's a great guy uh, and very enthusiastic. Um, we generated some embryonic stem cells in which we could inducibly activate notch signaling. And um, so I'm just going to click back and give you a, um, an overview of, of how notch signaling is activated because uh, I think I, I just charged right ahead without telling you about the mechanism. Um, not the notch receptor is embedded in the cell membrane and upon binding to an active ligand which is presented on a signaling cell, um, there's a, a cleavage event on the outside of the cell. And so this extracellular domain of notch is actually endocytosed by the neighboring cell uh, which actually triggers then a second cleavage event within the interior releasing this region that I'm going to refer to as the NICD. Uh, this intracellular domain then localizes to the nucleus, derepresses target genes, and activates transcription of, of, uh, of a number of genes, including some, um, uh, some involved in mitogenic signaling and, and growth. So the construct that he generated uh, drives expression of this intracellular domain. So bypassing the requirement for any cleavage event, he simply produces the, the, the NICD, uh, which can immediately localize to the nucleus and transactivate genes. Uh, and, and this simply depicts that the, the, the system is working. There are very low levels of the intracellular domain present when the stimulating compound is not present. Uh, and when doxycycline uh, is added, uh, intracellular domain is detected at high levels. And this is simply a, a Western blot depicting the, uh, the notch, notch uh, domain. And so when this experiment is set up, uh, we, we induce differentiation of these uh, embryonic stem cells uh, by removal of certain factors and, uh, and addition of others. And if, you know, and, and, and we've actually induced transcription of this transgene at, uh, at different intervals. But what we found was between days three and five, exposure to uh, the this ectopically expressed intracellular domain, um, when analyzed by CFU assays, would promote a great deal of expansion of hematopoietic progenitor activity. And when we look at the, um, the cell types that we are producing, by induction of, of notch signaling, we see an upregulation, almost a, here a doubling of a cell expressing V cadherin, which is thought to be an endothelial marker and, uh, and we also know is, is known to be expressed on hematopoietic precursors. Um, and so when we, uh, and this is simply a quantification, there's about a doubling of the number of cells that have hematopoietic potential. They're not necessarily hematopoietic cells, but if we sort those cells and plate them uh, in an assay that allows both development of endothelial cells and hematopoietic cells for uh, about 10 days, 10 day, uh, to, let's see, day six to 16, um, so an additional 10 days after we induce uh, notch signaling, we see that there's a great enrichment in blood cells in that fraction, which just confirms for us that indeed we do have uh, both an enrichment for this population of cells, but those cells are more competent to actually form blood. So not just promoting hematopoiesis in, in, this, uh, in this system. And so this, um, this encouraged us to look a little bit further and look downstream to see you know, what, 
what target genes might be changing when we activate Notch that could account for this en enhancement of hematopoiesis. And we identified several, but um, chose to follow up on one uh, for a, a variety of reasons. Um, FOXC2 is already known to lie upstream of notch signaling and is thought to be expressed in the signal sending cell and promotes production of, of notch ligands. Uh, and so it was, it was interesting to us that it appeared to be downstream. You know, we're, we're artificially activating notch and so now we get more of what should be targeting it from above. Uh, so we were intrigued and there's, there's actually a FOXC2 knockout mouse that already exists and it was known to be lethal uh, around uh, embryonic day 13.5 to 15.5. Um, but it wasn't recognized to actually have a hematopoietic phenotype at, a, at all. It just hadn't been analyzed. So we looked at this AGM region um, that I've described to you. And uh, it's a little bit difficult to see in the wild type figure. But there, uh, there's the aorta right here that's filled with blood. And around that, that perimeter at the lumen wall, you can see expression of RUNX1, which again it, uh, is a critical transcription factor for, um, for hematopoiesis. And if we look at that same region in the FOXC2 mutant mice, um, we see a depletion of RUNX1. So uh, there just aren't hematopoietic cells uh, on that endothelial lining. And so this is simply a quantification of that information. And if we look at the peripheral blood of these embryos, uh, at two time points, uh, E13.5 and E14.5, we see that there is actually an increase in the number of immature red blood cells. And m many of you probably already know that um, red blood cells uh, must go through a final maturation step, which includes extraction of the nuclei. No, so in, in most adults, our red blood cells do not have nuclei. And the embryos at E13.5 normally have about 50% of their cells uh, carrying a nucleus around, and it's more of an embryonic-like blood cell. So when the nucleus is lost, that's a really good indicator that the cell has matured. And, um, and so when we look at the mutants, we see that um, the number of enucleated, or those that don't have nuclei, is much lower in the mutant. Uh, and, and that's significant. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have my little asterisk here to indicate that P is less than 0 0.5, 0 0.05. <laughs> um, and, and, and that effect is exacerbated by E14.5. So as the, as the mouse ages, this effect gets worse. And if we look at expression of globin genes, uh, which can actually distinguish between embryonic-like and adult-like uh, uh, globins, we see that the mutant has a defect in uh, beta major, which is an adult-type globin. Uh, and, and, and yet, the embryonic-like globin, uh, beta H1, is relatively normal. So this kind of hints to us that uh, loss of FOXC2 is causing a defect, not in primitive hematopoiesis, but in definitive hematopoiesis. And that is really the process that I'm so intrigued by. And so just to kind of revisit um, notch signaling, um, we already knew that FOXC2 uh, was active in the signal sending cell and produced delta like 4 and uh, essentially um, promoted activation of notch signaling in the neighboring cell by producing more ligand. But now we think that FOXC2 may actually lie downstream uh, and, and is transcribed in response to, um, um, well, that, that it is uh, transcribed in response also to activation of not signaling here. So it may, in fact, be an important player. And uh, I haven't yet followed up on that, but it, uh, it encourages me to look a little bit more carefully at um, where my work might lead. Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about where I foresee my research moving. Um, I'd like to interrogate the role of Notch a bit more carefully uh, in the response to uh, biomechanical stress. Uh, I'd like to move this into a system wherein I can evaluate and tease apart the contribution of certain signaling pathways with pharmacological and soluble approaches. Um, the, the beauty of this is that uh, it will allow me to quickly move from either not signaling uh, to wind signaling and 
uh, analyze a variety of, of pathways, both in combination and in individually. Um, and I'd like to translate to the, to the human system the knowledge that I've gained with the mouse system and evaluate whether these same types of um, responses and mechanisms are present in, in human cells that then go on to form blood. Uh, so utilizing uh, induced pluripotent stem cell lines, um, perhaps uh, ES cell lines to evaluate their potential for blood formation in the presence of biomechanical stress. Um, and I'd like to also um, then look a little bit at other types of hemodynamic force. And, and I'll show you a little bit of data um, uh, for, for all of these. And so first, um, you know, one can imagine that you need to evaluate what the mechanism is for activation of notch signaling. And so you can kind of take, um, take an extracellular view and evaluate whether it's likely that a pulling and ripping off type mechanism, which has been proposed in the past, um, will allow cleavage of that extracellular domain. One can imagine if this domain is floating out there uh, uh, under flow pressure that a simple mechanical force could rip, rip that off. Um, it's actually, it has, um, it has some roots in the structure of the extracellular domain. These LNR repeats that you see here um, are thought to form a nice tight little coil and it's believed that uh, notch can only be activated if this neighboring cell binds with the, uh, the ligand and actually pulls and endocytosis both the ligand and the receptor. Um, so this, these LNR repeats are thought to essentially obscure the cleavage site. So only with pulling can you cleave. And, and this could, in fact, you know, trigger intracellular cleavage as well. So uh, because this has been proposed, and I think it, you know, a very simple means of testing it, albeit naive, would be to simply bind ligand uh, to a magnetic bead and simply place those beads on the cells and pull up the magnets and pop off the extracellular domain. So it's a little bit of a naive approach, um, but if downstream I see activation of notch, uh, target genes and or I see that notch has been cleaved, um, that would provide a little bit of a, uh, of a, um, a glimpse at mechanism. Um, and I can simply block the notch extracellular domain with an antibody and, and uh, evaluate whether it is truly involved uh, in any meaningful way in the activation of, of that blood program. Um, and so in terms of the genetic approaches that I would like to take, um, with regard to intracellular signaling, um, I, would, I would very much like to see what cell types are, are activating notch signaling because it, it is very likely that it's those that are going on to activate hematopoiesis uh, and, and upregulate uh, hematopoietic genes. So simply using a reporter system, um, I can culture cells under shear and profile the difference between those that are under static and those that are exposed to shear and, and really get a sense for cellular phenotypes, um, cell surface markers that are indicative of, of those that are now responding uh, by activation of notch. Uh, and, and a simple loss of function approach can be used to inhibit the intracellular cleavage event. Uh, Prenicillin uh, 1 is known to be essential for that intracellular uh, cleavage. So uh, those are just two kind of cursory looks. Um, and I think that, that this, this second um, approach that I would like to pursue is to really develop um, some of the, the soluble and pharmacological approaches that, uh, that we can use to, number one, address what pathways are critical for responsiveness to stress, um, but also as a means to um, develop somewhat of a reproducible instrument independent uh, way of directed differentiation of blood cells. And so this, this ideal uh, view of, of expanding the sources that we have for stem cell transplantation, um, I think will only be able to be implemented if, um, if soluble kind of consistent approaches are used rather than development of co costly instrumentation. Um, and, and in fact, um, what I, what I didn't really emphasize is that um, activation of some of these pathways that I see upregulated with biomechanical stress um, has been shown in culture systems to um, successfully expand 
more conventional sources of, of uh, hematopoietic cells. For example, umbilical cord can be plated on a culture surface that has notch ligand presented, uh, and there can be like a tenfold expansion of the cells that can then be transplanted into humans, which are, are now shown to be functional. So I think, I think that in addition to learning a lot about specification of blood, we can also stand to learn a few things about expansion of existing sources. And, and so some of, some of what we learn may be transferable, not necessarily all, but I think this is uh, a good means of, of getting there. So um, in, in collaboration with a postdoc in the lab, Garrett Hefner, um, we, we teamed up to try to stimulate embryonic stem cells with compounds that we knew were stimulating biomechanical responsive pathways. And, and so this, this, this process is, uh, simply involves differentiation of embryoid bodies from uh, embryonic stem cells, uh, dissociation, plating in a 96-well format, and upon that 96-well format, we're combining at least three or four different compounds uh, at different concentrations. And at the end of treating all of these wells very carefully and very uh, diligently, we pool them all together and then transplant into recipient mice. And, uh, and although it sounds foolish to pool them all and then, and then transplant, um, the beauty of the assay here is that embryonic stem cells uh, when not genetically modified and when not co-cultured on a, on a stromal supportive system, do not engraft recipient mice. So in this system, if I see any engraftment, it tells me that uh, some combination of beautiful uh, compounds that I threw on the cells has caused them to acquire engraftment potential uh, and form blood. And so um, there, there are two, two compounds that I may be a little backstory on. Um, some of you may recognize uh, Len Zahn. He's an investigator uh, adjacent to our lab that, that also studies hematopoiesis in the, uh, in the zebrafish. And, um, and in parallel with, with our study that showed that these embryonic precursors were responsive to shear stress and could form blood, um, they also showed that, that uh, if, you know, if loss of blood flow in zebrafish um, were produced, I, uh, like a, um, with, a, with a, a transgenic or knockout strain, uh, that they also saw loss of hematopoietic stem cells forming. And, and they can do this um, via the use of compounds. So I mentioned that L-name was a compound I showed in, in our own system, suppressed hematopoietic uh, formation. Uh, there are, there are a, a family of compounds that, that do block nitric oxide signaling. And so with blocking nitric oxide signaling, you can suppress hematopoietic uh, potential. Uh, and conversely, there are nitric oxide donors, which actually uh, artificially stimulate nitric oxide signaling. And those can be used to promote hematopoietic uh, potential. So in this aortic region, you see that based on this in situ hybridization, there are a lot more hematopoietic stem cells present. SNAP is, is one compound, SNP is the other and, uh, and L-arginine, in fact, um, can produce this enhancement. So that's one compound that I'm gonna show you that we've used. And the other one is from the same group in 07, um, had shown that uh, stimulation of uh, prostaglandin uh, by, well, I guess, uh, production of prostaglandins um, enhances engraftment of hematopoietic cells. And in fact, not only does it enhance engraftment, um, you actually need fewer cells to get successful engraftment of a donor. Uh, and, and the mechanism behind it is thought to be that PGE2 serves as somewhat of a mitogen, produces uh, at least one cell cycle, if not more, in these hematopoietic precursors, and so their efficiency increases in terms of expansion and engraftment. So um, that's the second uh, compound. So when we, Garrett and I, use this approach to treat our ES, ES cells that have been induced to differentiate, um, we see very little engraftment. And that's true for most of the compounds that we've screened. Um, but when combined with um, a few morphogens, these two compounds can promote engraftment of embryonic stem cells. So when we throw VEGF, SNAP, and PGE2 together, we actually see this profound engraftment 
um, 21.8 percent, which is huge on a background of zero. Um, that's that's pretty phenomenal. And if we we look at the lineages that form, we see that they're predominantly myeloid. So we're not actually getting lymphoid lineages out of this, but we are getting some progenitors. Uh, similarly, if we stimulate with sonic hedgehog, SNAP, and PGE2, we see a high level of engraftment. So it's about 6%, and we see lymphoid lineages. And I'll just point out here that um, in some mice, we see lymphoid engraftment, in some we see myeloid. We n have not yet seen engraftment of both. Um, so it'll be interesting to pursue this uh, a bit more carefully and see what's happening, if, whether there's a, a lineage switch or whether the same precursors exist or whether there's a bias. So more needs to be done on this. Um, and again, uh, Wnt signaling by stimulating with Wnt3, uh, we see myeloid engraftment and, and it, it too is uh, very promising. And so what I might propose then is a kind of a transition to the human system. There would be a, a lot that would need to be done in terms of optimization um, using the same kind of overview. I think screening by a CFU assay would be reasonable, using a time course uh, and, and media cytokines, uh, evaluate whether multi-step expansions are required. Um, some of the work that I've done with uh, human ES cells um, tells me that there are periods that are very critical for treatment with certain cytokines, and, and so a multi-step approach may be necessary. Uh, I think as much optimization as I can do with in vitro assays is, is great. I'd also like to um, ex, uh, expose them to shear stress. I already have some data that would suggest that um, gene, expressions, gene expression is enhanced. So RUNCS1 expression uh, is, is boosted in human cells. They were uh, human IPS cells. Uh, so RUNX1 uh, is upregulated, but I'd like to see that, uh, that functional readout in vitro with CFU assay. And, and finally, um, some of the, the nice candidates could be translated into an immunocompromised strain of, of mice um, for, for more of a transplant, transplantation setting. And, um, and so finally, I'll just kind of touch on some of the work that I've done in collaboration with um, Don Ingber and Yusuke Torisawa. And, and um, I was just very interested in whether other biomechanical forces could stimulate hematopoiesis as well. Uh, they have a microfluidic device that they've designed. Um, they actually have a beautiful paper uh, that was published in Science last year that showed uh, that uh, essentially culture of lung epithelia under shear conditions and with stretching uh, can produce very different responses in terms of behavior of the cells uh, and their functionality. So we have adapted the system. It's taken a little bit of time to um, translate that to our embryonic precursor cells. And as you can see here, the system is very similar. We have an outflow. We have an, an inflow that's driven by a syringe pump. So we can flow in media at a given rate. And based on the uh, dimensions of the chamber, we can calculate what shear stress these cells are exposed to. And so simply, uh, the culture surface consists of this thin little membrane uh, that looks blue here with little cells on it, um, and two side chambers, which allow us to apply vacuum pressure. Uh, and so you can imagine as these side chambers collapse, the membrane is stretched in the middle. So we can expose shear and stretching at the same time. So we've done this with our embryos. And um, I wanted to just give you kind of a visual image of what uh, what the cells are experiencing. It's just a, just a very quick movie. So it's, it, it doesn't seem substantial, but um, these are cells exposed to 2.5 hertz uh, at a 5% elongation. And, and based on the heart rate of the embryo at this stage, we expect that this rate is typical. The elongation still needs some optimization. Um, but what we've found is that in fact, with, this is preliminary data, with two iterations of the experiment, we see that combination of the wall shear stress with the strain um, produces an, a greater enhancement of hematopoietic activity just by methyl cellulose ass assays um, than shear stress alone. So we're finding, just in here again, um, it's, in some cases it's about a twofold ex expansion in hematopoietic activity, and in, and in other cases it's, it's a bit less. Um, so 
I think this is encouraging. It tells us that there's a um, contribution of stretching to the shear responsiveness. And so then there are two biomechanical forces that I think we need to take a more careful look at. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge then my mentor, who is an absolutely fantastic uh, mentor and uh, man. <laughs> um, been very supportive in terms of um, how to choose my questions uh, and how to pursue science. Uh, Dr. Donald Ingber is a very creative person. Uh, Guillermo Garcia Cartena has uh, been along for the, the entire ride as a vascular biologist and has, has brought to us this um, lateral plate technology that allows us to uh, really pursue new questions. Um, Ilho Jang, which is the graduate student doing the work on Notch. Garrett Hefner, who's helping with the soluble compounds and screening of um, engraftment and transplanted mice. And Yusuke Torisawa, who's really a fantastically um, enthusiastic and dedicated collaborator. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes. So are you, are you wondering what the mechanism actually is, how the cells are sensing this? Could you say the last part? So, um, this, so, so essentially the question is, uh, you know, how, how is it that the mechanical force is uh, impacting hematopoiesis and what really is the mechanism? Is it just that growth factor is increased? Uh, So, so most of our assays and the data that I showed you have been done in vitro with a constant refresh rate of the, of the media. So we have an inflow and an, an outflow. So the media is refreshed at the same rate on the static cultures and the shear exposed cultures. So although you could envision that the, the swirling of the media might disturb any kind of microenvironmental niche that could get established on the culture plate, um, all of the, all, I would imagine that all of the growth factors would be present to, this, to a s similar extent unless we're actually impacting production from those cells. If we're stimulating gro growth factor, for example, uh, then you know, that's, that's something I haven't looked at, but it is a, is a good idea. Sure, go ahead, go ahead. So the gene expression? So we did not do a microarray analysis, if, if that's kind of what you're asking. Um, and, and hopefully in the next month, we will have data on some sorted populations, because all of the data I've shown you is essentially based on a mixed population of cells. Um, but what we're, what we're planning to do is actually sort out uh, specific populations that are, are known to be hematopoietic precursors. And, um, and then look a little bit more carefully by, by global uh, expression. And so the, the gene expression that I did show you was, uh, was based on uh, quantitative uh, RT-PCR. That's a, that's a fantastic question. So in many cases, we do see that we have greater numbers of cells. Um, so, so I'm gonna say yes, we haven't looked carefully by BRDU. And so analysis of the culture plate uh, by microscopy is just kind of at its infancy. We haven't really had the instrumentation to uh, kind of carefully collect images, certainly not time-lapse uh, images, which I would like to do, um, but to monitor cell behavior real time would be nice and to, to do some uh, kind of in situ assays where we're looking perhaps at. at the increase in gene expression? 
Well, right. Um, so we have, we have not really looked at cell cycle regulated genes in our system. It could be that, that they are changed. And, and I think because we see um, generally a larger number of cells, that could be true. Um, but there's variability from one experiment to another. So in some cases, we might plate the same number of cells and the static, uh, the static culture might actually have a greater number. So um, the difference could be subtle, but I think the general trend is for a greater number on the, on the shear exposed plates. Yes. Dif differentiation as well, yep. So, I mean, it's not that not is not known to do specification, but do you think your data is really uh, addressing specification? Because you have a pretty dramatic increase. Is that from specification or is it all from proliferation? You know, um, I would argue that, that it is probably going to be specification because, as I said, I think in many cases, um, the number of additional cells that we get that are hematopoietic uh -huh. can't really be accounted for um, in the precursor pool. Uh, I suspect that we're impacting both. Um, and again, it's hard, it's hard to, to make any con conclusions about what the upstream pathway is that's activated and what downstream effects may exist from that. Even regardless of worrying about downstream upstream effects, mm -hmm. I still feel like you're sitting on a pathway that is affecting the very first decision point. I would like to think that I am as well. Uh, you mean wind or no, notch, notch, right? right. The data suggests that that's where you're headed. That's what is potentially happening, which is which be its fabulous. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And um, yes, thank you for selling my data for me. That's great. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, and I think I think that uh, folks that study notch signaling believe that it's a great candidate for for mechanical sensing just because of this principle that it is absolutely required that you endocytose that ligand and pull the extracellular domain off. And whether it's extending for the cleavage or just ripping it, I mean, there's, there's obviously there's a, an enzyme that is mediating that cleavage. But that, that occluded domain needs to be removed or revealed. And, uh, and, and, I, and I think it's not far-fetched to envision that as these aortic clusters kind of fill the lumen, bud off into the lumen, um, it's more complex than simply one cell hanging out there waiting to be ripped off or waiting to have notch torn off like the little receptors. I think what's more likely is that the cells that are then going to go on and bud are attached to other cells. And th those other cells are likely presenting uh, delta-like one or you know these, these other um, notch signaling cells are essentially activating um, the, the, ce the cells that are leaving by simply just this, this strain between the two cells. So then are you arguing that notch pathway could be sitting in both where it's involved in specification and proliferation of blood cells, but also involved in mechanotransduction of that? Both of those I think that the two are probably supporting one another. Um, and and because we're finding that FOXY2 seems to be lying upstream and downstream, uh, or you know, essentially of notch signaling, so the signal sending and the signal receiving are both kind of activating notch and reinforcing one another, um, it could be that um, notch is activated. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just keep it at that. Yeah, I, I think that the um, that it's immediately responding to mechanical force, but then as the blood program is induced, it's probably really propagated. So yes. Hemopoietic uh, niche is a three dimensional multi cell unit. So, who's the responder of the mechanical signal in this cascade of cells? Yeah, I would, I would like to know. And I think that, um, that the way I would propose to address that is actually to start then um, tracing 
cell lineages individually and exposing those to shear and looking for downstream effects and, and subdividing cells after shear as well and looking at, at activation of, uh, of notch and, and other pathways that are, are um, mediating this response. So, so some, and this may not really address your question, but some of what I've done um, to begin to address this is kind of a, almost a prospective sort of approach where I've taken a mouse strain that expresses GFP in every lineage of the body, and I've sorted out a specific population. And I've just taken kind of a very gross approach where I'm sorting VEK adherent positive cells, which are thought now to really lie upstream of the hematopoietic lineages. And by culturing those either in isolation or in co-culture with other just non-fluorescent cells derived from the, the PSP region, I'm then tracing which cells have hematopoietic potential kind of downstream. And so I think with some creative cell tracing approaches, I might then start to get at what you're asking. Um, and, uh, and certainly kind of, um, you know, uh, one approach too would be to deplete cells that are essential for this, uh, this sheer responsiveness. So if I deplete a supportive cell that may actually be the signal sending cell, um, and, and I see a decrease in hematopoietic uh, potential, essentially down to static level, that's gonna tell me a little bit that I'm on the right track in terms of identifying that, that perhaps mesenchymal cell that is just providing, um, uh, providing kind of a, uh, I guess it's serving as an intermediary for example, uh, to the hematopoietic precursor downstream. There may be more creative approaches to get at it, but um, initially, I mean, I think it's, it, it's a complex milieu of cells, uh, and so developing tools to really get at that are, are challenging. Uh, not that I'm aware of. And and, and then, well, that's not exactly true. I mean, I think people are very interested in it. Um, they're, they're analyzing it in an in vivo context. And, and I think with a variety of kind of some cell tracing approaches, um, they have a very good sense for the direction that cells are pulling. And, um, and so clearly the, the type of biomechanical force is a little bit different. It's reliant on kind of cell adhesion type uh, pressure. Um, so yes, I mean, uh, people are studying it. Um, very few people are actually pulling that tissue out and, and modulating the strain themselves. Um, and, and so, and I think also like cell ablation type strategies have been used, I think in uh, Drosophila, for example, to, to alleviate kind of a pull in a certain direction and they kind of see how cells respond downstream. So some of that is being done for sure. Um, just the in, in vitro approach is, uh, maybe a little bit more messy for, for um, a fly larva. I do know someone who is interested in, in using some instrumentation to study, um, um, I think, wing development um, in, uh, in Drosophila using just this cyclic strain, more of a pulling, obviously not, not flow because I don't think that's playing a big role, but, uh, but using cyclic strain. Yes. Emmett. So two quick questions. Um, um, not sure what the answer. The first one is about the role of FOXY2. Um, so it seems that FOXY2 works in both things, outside the cell and inside the cell. It's almost as if it's regenerating itself in a way. Yes. So how is FOXY2 seen? FOXY2 um, and the other one is a bit more abstract, which is uh, the heartbeat in many cases is correlated with size. Right. And compare that to something that's macroscopic, like a chicken egg. So a chicken egg mechanically has to rotate. Yes. Egg. And so I'm wondering if any studies that you see chicken egg may help to correlate with what's going on in the embryology and the physiological Interesting. Okay, so let's go back to the first question. Um, and, and maybe you could kind of reword for me uh, the, the first question just a little bit. So the role of Fox 2. Right. 
Uh, what's upstream? Upstream of Foxy two. Basically, since all Foxy two is gone, mm -hmm. how can we get this rotation? So, like when do you put the brakes on? That's a good question. Um, I I don't have a good answer for you actually, um, and and this is data that we've just kind of recently generated and. And it's been a surprise, right, that, that it's lying downstream of Notch. Um, so no, I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to try to speculate how one might put the brakes on, because I don't think we entirely understand in our system um, which cell type, for example, is actually presenting Notch ligand. Um, and, and I'd really actually like to get at more um, the population level and, and determine what pathways are activated in the true hematopoietic precursor. So, you know, with, with the notch overexpression, we're expressing notch in every cell in that embryoid body. So it is artificial, right? And I think that some more directed approaches that are, that are targeted to specific cell types might really start to kind of refine uh, the mechanism behind it. Um, yeah, so in, in, in our system, uh, every cell is overexpressing this intracellular domain and so activating notch. Um, and, and the second question is uh, whether, whether uh, chicken egg <laughs> development can inform uh, some, of, some of the maybe mechanism or, or importance of what I'm doing. And I haven't thought of chicken eggs. It's, it's clever, but I do know that that's necessary and, uh, and I'm not sure precisely why eggs need to be flipped. But, um, Nice perspective. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs>